Revelation 21, 9. Then one of the seven angels came to me and talked with me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her light was like a most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Also, she had a great and high wall with 12 gates and 12 angels at the gates and names written on them, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. The 12 gates were 12 pearls. Each individual gate was of one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. But I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city had no need of the sun or of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light, and the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light. And the kings of the earth bring their glory and honor into it. Its gates shall not be shut at all by day. There shall be no night there. Wow. And they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. But there shall be no means enter it. I'm sorry. But there shall by no means enter it anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie. But only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. What a passage. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this picture of heaven, the new Jerusalem, the bride coming down out of heaven. And Lord, we anxiously look forward to that place where there are no more tears, no more sorrow. There's joy forevermore. There's nothing there that defiles it. No abomination, no sin. Just, just, just the bliss of being with you. God, we anxiously look to that. We anxiously look to that time of being face to face with you. So tonight, Lord, show us what that looks like here on earth. Show us how to see your praises and thrones. How to show us how to see you here. In Jesus' name, amen. That passage, that picture of heaven, the fact that there's no more sin, it shows us or reminds us of a phrase you may have heard that the gospel delivers us from the penalty of sin at salvation. When we're saved, boom, we're delivered from the penalty of sin. The wages of sin are death, and I no longer have to worry about death. I don't have, no longer have to worry about hell. I've been delivered from the penalty of sin. But the gospel also delivers us from the power of sin. Sin has power over us and control over us, but when we are dead to sin, when we come to Christ, there's a sanctification process, and that sanctification process is becoming more like Jesus. As we become more like Jesus, we're delivered from the, from the power of sin. But then that third step, the most exciting step, is the gospel delivers us from the presence of sin, the very presence of sin at glorification. When we go to heaven, there is no more sin around us. In fact, that passage that we just looked at said there was nothing there anymore to defile. Revelation 21, 27. But there shall by no means enter it anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. So salvation, or the gospel, delivers us from the penalty of sin, the power of sin, and eventually the presence of sin. It's a beautiful picture. And this chapter that we're going to be looking at in Numbers 5 is all about avoiding the defilement so that God would still be present. Now, that, the, the challenge is that the word defile is a word that, like, what, what does defile mean? In fact, in fact, if I say the word defile, what comes to mind? Just shout out some words. Make impure. What else? Not holy. What else? Dirty. Corrupt. Stinky, okay? Anything else? Ruined, okay? What was that? Rotten. Rotten, yeah, yeah. Okay, so all those words, that, that's what comes to mind when we think of defiled. It's like, uh, it's, it's dirty, it's disgusting, it's... Uh, and, and the word, when you, when you look it up, it means to make unclean or impure. And it's got four different sub-definitions. To corrupt the purity or perfection of something. To corrupt the purity or perfection of something or to debase it. Or to violate the chastity. To deflower. 
to make physically unclean, especially with something unpleasant or contaminating, or to violate the sanctity of, desecrate. You know, when you're making dinner, and, that, and, you, and you're, you're stirring up that dinner, and all of a sudden you walk away, and then you turn around and you see a roach fall inside the dinner. It's takeout tonight. You know, it's just like, that's defiled. It is, it's, there's no way I'm going to go, no, that, it's not my house, okay, in case you're wondering, in case I invite you over and you're thinking that's what I saw. No, but, but I do remember, I remember my first mission trip, I was in uh, Guatemala, and um, we just got into town, we're staying at a host home's house, and, um, you know, and, and they're, they're putting us up in nice houses, which for our standard of living, it's just like a modern, I mean, kind of a middle class family, but for where we were in Guatemala, that was. But I remember sitting down, and they, th- they served something that was really creamy with goat's milk, and I'd never had goat's milk or anything. And then I look across in the kitchen, and I see the, 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 the countertop moves. Goat's milk didn't sound so appetizing, and now it's really not appetizing at all, because it's just, I feel there's a, there's a defilement, right? There's, a, there's something there. Ugh, just, ugh. Well, this chapter, nine times in Numbers chapter 5, it talks about defilement. Because the defilement causes something that God doesn't want to happen. Let's look at this. Chapter 5, verse 1 of Numbers. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Command the children of Israel that they put out of the camp every leper, everyone who has a discharge, and whoever becomes defiled by a corpse. You shall put out both male and female. You should put them outside the camp that they may not defile their camps in the midst of which I dwell. And the children of Israel did so and put them outside the camp as the Lord spoke to Moses, so the children of Israel did. Okay, just this first little bit, this first section of the chapter talks about three different types of people that they're supposed to separate out. Three different types. The leper, everyone with a discharge, and then those defiled by a corpse. Now, we can, we're going to go into that in a little bit more detail, but we've got to focus on what the reason is. Why did he want them separated? Why did he want them out of there? He tells us there at the end of that, at the end of that verse, at the end of verse 3, not defile the camp in the midst of which I dwell. They don't want to defile the camp because God is there. Remember, that's what's distinct. That's what's special about the nation of Israel is that God says, I will be their, pe- I will be their God. I will, you will be my people. And as a result, he will dwell in their midst. And literally, the tabernacle would be God there, present. Now, we know that God is present everywhere. But there was something special about God's presence with the nation of Israel. You know, you may have, op- may have often heard this verse in Habakkuk, Habakkuk verse, uh, chapter 113. You are of purer eyes than to behold evil. This is speaking of God. God, you are of purer eyes than to behold evil and cannot look on wickedness. And most people stop there. And they'll think, yeah, God can't be in the presence of sin. How many have heard that? God can't be in the presence of sin. I've heard that. I mean, it's like uh, God, God can't be in the presence of sin. He just he casts it out because he won't tolerate the presence of sin. The problem is if that is totally true, you and I'd be done for already. Because God's still allowing us to be here. And of course, as you read the rest of the Bible, we see that Job, in, this, in the, the book of Job, Satan comes into the presence of God. I mean, we don't want to talk about sin. That's sin incarnate, and yet God still allows it. So what this verse is talking about is not that God can't be in the presence of sin, but there's, there's something deeper here. In fact, the rest of the verse, your pure eyes than to behold evil cannot look on wickedness. Why do you look on those who deal treacherously? And, behold, and hold your tongue when the wicked devours a person more righteous than he. Basically he's saying, you cannot look on evil, and yet you do see what's going on, and yet you don't do anything, God. Pastor Dave talked about the whole book of Habakkuk a couple of weeks ago with the, the shooting down in Parkland. And that's what the book of Habakkuk is about, is about. It's about the fact that there's evil in this world, and God, why aren't you judging evil? It's a great book to study for our modern times. But here... The point is, is that, yes, God is holy and pure, but his, his presence, where he makes himself manifestly known, he will not do that in the presence of evil. So in other words, yes, God is present everywhere, and he, he, he can handle evil. It's not too much for him, but he's choosing not to go be manifestly present if there's defiling things there. You know, there's some churches you walk into, and you just sense the presence of God. There's other churches you walk into, and I don't sense the presence of God. And, and is there something defiling there? Is there something there that God's 
kind of holding back that he's really like, you know, I, I'm their God, yes, but there's, I, I don't, I don't want to hang out there. There's something there that, that God's like, I don't want to be a part of that, that makes it defiled. The problem is this defilement creeps in. It's usually not just one thing. That defilement is, is layers upon layers of stuff that creeps in over time in people's lives and in the church. This whole chapter, Numbers chapter 5, is about defilement in the congregation of Israel, but I believe the application is great for us today because that congregation, it applies to us. What, what we might do that might defile the congregation and as a result cause God's presence to leave or God to, to step out and, and not be as manifestly present. So let's look a little, deep, little deeper here. Numbers chapter 5, verse 2. Command the children of Israel that they put out of the camp every leper, everyone who has a discharge, and, and whoever becomes defiled by a corpse. Now, leprosy, uh, we did a whole teaching on this on, on Leviticus chapter 13. It refers not just to Hansen's disease where the, the skin rots away, but any skin disease in general, they were supposed to get them out of the camp. And the result is many of these skin diseases were contagious. The biggest problem with leprosy is that it causes the, the nerve cells to go numb. And so leprosy is always a picture of sin. And the more sin that we allow in our life, the more numb we are to sin. God says, I don't want any leprosy in the camp. I don't want anything that's numbing your ability to be sensitive to sin. The problem with our culture today, and with our world today, is it's so sin-saturated that we no longer have a sense of the sin. We're, we're, we're numb to the sin because we see it all day. There were times when I, when I first became a, a Christian, uh, you know, I watched a lot of movies and that were not necessarily good movies, and so it didn't, you know, initially the Holy Spirit was slowly convicting me, and, and so I stopped watching some of those movies, and uh, a few like last year, I went and watched one of those movies that I watched you know, years ago that I thought, oh, yeah, that's a good movie. And I went and watched it. I'm like, oh, wow, that, 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 like, I, I feel defiled. It didn't bother me back then when I was a young Christian. And why? Well, because I wasn't as sensitive to sin back then. I wasn't as sensitive to the language. It's like these F-bombs. It, like, it was no big deal back then. But now it's like, I, I, I can't take this anymore. It just, it, it's because of the sensitivity to sin. But when we're in the world and walking in the world... We just get numb to it. I want you to think about, think about a house, or maybe it's a garage for you guys, in that you clean the garage, you clean the house, it looks great. And you have one thing out of place, and you see it. You see that one thing that's out of place. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. I got to fix it. The problem is, if you have three or four things out of place, then a fifth thing is not really that noticeable that it's out of place. And then pretty soon, it gets cluttered, and, we, and you get some more clutter, and you don't notice the new clutter, because the old clutter clutters the old, and it's, you just have this mess like my office. So I wasn't going to show you a picture because I'm trying to clean it. But the point is, if, if we have a mess, if we have the, the, the more sin stuff that's going on in our life, the more desensitized we are to it. And the result is we're, we're numb and we're going to miss the fact when the new sin creeps in and that causes defilement. So God's saying here, I don't want leprosy in the camp. I don't want the congregation to be desensitized to sin. So things that defile the church, it's people that are not sensitive to sin. And how it most often manifests today is people misusing grace. We don't have time to go into a deep, a deep study of this. Pastor Dave did a, a tremendous study when we went through the book of Jude and on grace. Um, we often say grace covers sin. Yeah, but more importantly, grace empowers us not to sin. And so there's a, there's a higher standard of holiness. And so, yes, thank God for grace. I am saved by grace. I am maintained and sustained by God's grace. I can't do it on my own. A Pharisee says, yeah, I'm saved by grace. Now i got to work harder. That's what a Pharisee says. And a Pharisee thinks that, no, well, now I can do it. No, I, I still need the grace of God day by day, moment by moment, to live this Christian walk. And as a result of relying on the grace of God, not my own ingenuity, not my own stick to not the fact that if I just try harder, I can do this Christian. No, those are all lies. Those are all Phariseeisms that lead us back into bondage. But it's only the grace of God. But understanding that the grace is not a license to sin, and that's what, of course, um, Romans 6, 7, and 8 are all about. So things that defile the church, people that are not sensitive to sin, misusing grace. Back in Numbers 5, to command the children of Israel that they put out of the camp every leper, everyone who has a discharge, and whoever becomes defiled by a corpse. 
All right. Everyone who has a discharge. This is, you know, this is where it gets a little bit gross. This is actually one of those gross chapters. I know Dave intentionally gives me all the gross chapters. <laughs> if you've been here at Reveal for any length of time, you know I taught the, the Leviticus chapter on discharges. I taught the Leviticus chapter. Anyway, on, on all of those things. Um, but a discharge, what is a discharge? A discharge is something that's in the body. Um, it's pus. It's stuff that's not supposed to be there, and it's getting out of the body any way it can, right? God says, I don't want my people to have discharges. Well, spiritually, what does that mean in the, in the body of Christ? I think the biggest discharge that we are so accustomed to, and we don't really see it as oozing pus, gossip. Talk about a discharge. It's something that's festering inside, and then I got to get it out. Did you hear about so-and-so? I, I got to share a prayer request. Let me share a prayer request with you about so-and-so. This is what's going on, and their marriage is in a shambles. And, they, and then he said this, and all, of a sudden, and all of a sudden, all I'm doing is I'm exposing their sin. And, and here's the thing. Most of the time when we do it, we don't think that I'm gossiping. We think, I'm sharing something that's important, and you need to know, because it's just, it's like, like everybody needs to know about their sin. Uh, really? Is that what you want people talking about, your sin? You see, gossip is one of those things that defiles, it's, 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 a, um, it's a discharge. Um, it happens, it happened in the early church, it happened, it's, it's just our nature to gossip. First Timothy 5.11, the younger widows should not be on the list of widows, because their physical desires will overpower their devotion to Christ and they will want to remarry. Then they would be guilty of breaking their previous pledge. And if they're on the list, they will learn to be lazy and will spend their time gossiping from house to house, meddling in other people's business and talking about things they shouldn't. Paul is so direct here. He says, hey, if the young widows, basically if the young unmarried, you know, they're widows because they get, they get married young, and so if they're, if they're middle-aged, 30, 40, 50, they need to get married again. And the reason is, otherwise they're going to become a gossip. And it's a strange thing. It's like, well, that's pretty judgmental, Paul, uh, to saying that, you know, women are going to be gossips and, pl and placing all the blame on women. Well, the issue was at that culture, the women, either they were married, if they weren't married, especially if they were on the widow's list and they had a free income, which is what the widow's list meant, you were being provided for, then they didn't have anything to do to keep them busy. And so the result is they would keep themselves and being busy at a busy buddy. That sounds like a tongue twister. But busy buddies, and that's what the result, and that, that's not just the case of women, that's the case of anybody. When you have too much time on your hands, what do you do? You talk about other people. And God's like, no, that's a discharge. I don't want that in the body of Christ. I don't want my people discharging other things. First Peter 4, 8, and above all things have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. That's the opposite of gossip. Gossip exposes sin, love covers sin. Think about the next time you're talking about somebody. Think about the next time you're sharing a prayer request. When you're sharing that prayer request, here, okay, so there's, there's different ways. You share the prayer request. Another one is, you know, I don't know how to deal with this situation. What situation? Well, here's the situation. Gossip, 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 gossip. That's what that is. Well, but I don't know how to deal with it. Go to the Lord. Yeah, but, but he hasn't told me. Well, go back to the Lord. Go to the Word. Well, but I, and if, and if you, if you like still feel like you don't know what to do, and you got a problem with somebody else, well, the Bible tells you, you go to that person. But I don't, they're, they're not going to listen. It's not what the, the Bible doesn't say. Go to them unless they won't listen. If they don't listen, then you can tell everybody else about it. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says if you've got a problem with your brother or your sister, you go to that person. Yeah, but I just don't know. He's not going to listen. It doesn't matter. The Bible says you go to that person. And the result is... Oh, well, then I'll go to this person. Well, I need to know. I need some help. I need some moral support. Gossip, 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 gossip. Man, so. Any, any, and <laughs> here's the other thing, sad thing. It used to be that we only gossiped in private and in quiet. Now we gossip on Facebook. And we put all sorts of stuff on Facebook that is definitely not covering sin. In fact, it's covering it like the news. That's how we're covering it. And God says, no, if we're going to cover sin, we're supposed to cover over it. We're not, supposed, we're not supposed to expose other people's sin. We're supposed to confront sin and let the Holy Spirit bring conviction, but we're not supposed to expose it to the world. We're not supposed to just tell everybody, hey, did you hear about so-and-so? No. Love covers a multitude of sin. Numbers 
The third point, come, command the children of Israel that they put out of the camp every leper, everyone who has a discharge, and whoever becomes defiled by a corpse. This is a strange word because the word corpse there is actually the word Hebrew word nefesh, which means the flesh. So anybody that's defiled by the flesh. Now the intention is, yeah, a corpse, a dead body, right? Jude 22, and on some having compassion, making a distinction, but others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, even hating the garment defiled by the flesh, the flesh, the flesh, the flesh. Yes, dead things defile a person because disease can spread. But the flesh, our flesh is the stinking thing that manipulates us and, com- and controls us unless we put it to death. So things that defile the church, people that are not sensitive to sin, people that have a discharge or gossip, and people that are, are about the flesh. What is the flesh? What pleases me? What satisfies me? Even as we did songs today, where you're thinking, oh, man, I haven't, we haven't heard shout to the Lord in a long time. Oh, I love that song. You love the song or you love the Lord that the song's about? I mean, you know, it's okay to love a song. It's, I'm, not, I'm not trying to beat you up because you like a song or you don't like a song. Maybe you're like, oh, that song's so old. It's so 80s or 90s. It's a long time ago anyway, whatever time it was. The whole point being is, what, what do we come into church for? Oh, Pastor Dave's not teaching. (laughs) Yeah, some of you thought that. That's why it's funny, because some of you thought that. Oh, yeah, but but do you come here for Pastor Dave? Hope not. Do you come here because your best friend is here? Hope not. Do you come here because you like the worship? I hope not. I hope you come because you want to see Jesus. I hope you come because you want to experience the presence of God. I hope you're coming for that reason, not any other reason. That's what the challenge is. Our world today says, have it your way. Our world today says it's all about you. Here, we can custom fit the size of your shoes, the pants, whatever, to you. We're going to customize it to you. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says, no, I'm supposed to customize me to you. That's who I'm supposed to adapt to. I'm supposed to become more and more like the image of Jesus, not try to fashion Jesus in my image. So people that are about the flesh, that's what defiles a church. And when we are all about what satisfies us, what pleases us, um, that's when we get problems. That's when, that's when the church is defiled. Um, and also about the flesh, remember the flesh touching death, it's amazing. There are some churches that are um, predominantly pro-abortion. You want to talk about death. That's, oh. And you know, not trying to get political, I'm just trying to get biblical, Um, that when we look at the scriptures, that baby is a baby, it's a baby, it has, I mean, it's, it's so, so crazy that our world has turned everything upside down and made it about a choice instead of about a child, we need to, we need to recognize what the truth is, we need to come back to the truth and not have a culture of death that we tolerate death, now, that's to say, hey, I have friends that love Jesus, and they're still, I would say they're pro-abortion. They would say they're not pro-abortion, they're pro-choice, but um, either way, I'm like, ah, I disagree with them. I'm not going to break fellowship and say they're heretics, but I'm going to say, man, look at the scriptures. Look at Psalm 139. Look at these places. Look at the fact that Jesus, um, that the baby wept or leapt in the mother's womb. Look at the fact that the DNA is different. Look at the fact, I mean, so many things. A culture of death that we have today is like, it's inconvenient. That was the culture of Molech in the Bible where they offered the babies on burning arms of fire. We do the same today. And it defiles the church when we allow that, when we condone that in the church. Culture of death. Culture of the flesh. People that are of the flesh. Romans 8, 5. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can it be. In other words, the carnal mind can't even obey God. It doesn't want to, and so it won't submit to God's law. Verse 8, so then those who are in the flesh cannot please God, but you're not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. 
We need to walk in the flesh. Walk in the spirit, not in the flesh. We walk so easily in the flesh because our world around us wants us to. Our world around us encourages us to. Our world around us says it's okay. Everybody's doing it. Most Christians, once they leave the building, look much like the rest of the world. Not just the clothes they wear. Not just the cars they drive. Not just the TV shows that they watch. The rest of their life looks the same. Oh, yeah, they may slap a Bible verse on it, a fish or a dove, but we need to be distinct. We need to be a holy people and not allow ourselves to be defiled. Numbers 5, verse 5. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel. When a man or woman commits any sin that men commit in unfaithfulness against the Lord, and that person is guilty, then he shall confess the sin which he has committed. He shall make restitution for his trespass in full, plus one-fifth of it, and give it to the one he has wronged. But if the man has no relative to whom restitution may be made for the wrong, the restitution for the wrong must go to the Lord for the priest, in addition to the ram of the atonement with which the atonement is made for him. Every offering of all the holy things of the children of Israel, which they bring to the priest, shall be his. And every man's holy things shall be his. Whatever any man gives to the priest shall be his. Okay, this is a strange passage, but basically, once again, another thing that defiles is when we have unfaithfulness and not following through with making restitution. Um, so things that defile, people are not sensitive to sin, people who have a discharge or gossip, people that are about the flesh and serving themselves, and people who don't make restitution or leave things unresolved. I see so, this so often in the church. You know, somebody does something wrong against me, or I do something wrong against somebody. And they come up to me and they say, hey, sorry, that's okay. Was it okay? No, it was sin. It was wrong. But I say it's okay, and so the result is I've, I've, you know, I've just kind of washed it over. I've whitewashed it, and the other person's like, hey, good. And so the result is there's no restitution. There's no making things right. We just kind of keep doing the same thing over and over. No, 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 no. No, it's like it was wrong. You know, I appreciate you apologizing. Yeah, it was wrong. Yeah, it hurt what you said. Yeah, it hurt what you did. But thank you for at least apologizing. And then the person apologizing should say, you know what? I got to make things right. Not just that I restored to you what I took, whether it was your integrity, whether it was your, your reputation, whether it was your money, whether it was how I, you know, whatever it was, but I'm supposed to give a fifth or 20% more to show that I want to, it, it has to cost me. Our, our sin today so often doesn't cost us. And our, our, our forgiveness and our restitution doesn't cost us. In, in this day, remember, when they came and they, they had to get things right, they had to offer a sacrifice from their flock. They had to take a lamb that was theirs, and they had to literally cut it and see its death flow, see its life flow out of it. There was a cost. That cost me because of my foolish thought. That animal died because of me. There was a cost. Today, we like, ah, it's no big deal. It's no big deal. Live and let live. I forgive you. I hate you. That's what we do, right? We say, I forgive you, but I'm not going to trust you ever again. I forgive you, but uh, there's a problem with that. I forgive you, but. No. I mean, yes, there's a sense in which there's a difference between restoration and reconciliation and forgiveness. We are called to forgive regardless. And if forgiveness is hard, I have to recognize that Jesus paid for that. And so the result is Jesus paid for their sin against me. And when I recognize that he paid for their sin against me, then I can, I can forgive because it's no longer mine to hold. It's no longer my debt to hold against them because Jesus paid it. I can't hold somebody's debt that's been paid for. That's wrong. That's actually stealing. I'm saying you owe me when they don't owe me because Jesus paid for their debt. But how many Christians keep holding on to that debt? How many Christians keep walking in unforgiveness? Unforgiveness, which leads to bitterness. Actually, the word unforgiveness you won't see in the Bible. It's really the word bitterness. It's the word bitterness. I'm holding on to something, and I'm, I'm, I'm somehow thinking that by me holding on to it, I'm punishing you for what you did to me. That's a lie of the enemy. That's the lie of Satan, saying that somehow by me holding on, I'm punishing you. Most cases, the other person's like, oh, I have no clue. <laughs> they have no clue, and they're living their life fine, and while you are steeped in bitterness, you are, and, and, and you're not, I'm a Christian, so I'm not steeped in bitterness. I've just got it boiling underneath. 
right? No, no, it doesn't work. It doesn't work like that. Like Dave was saying, it's a vegetarian butcher. It doesn't work. Carnal Christian doesn't work. Bitterness with a Christian, not supposed to be there. Not supposed to be there at all. So we're called to make restitution. We're not, we're not supposed to leave things unresolved. We're supposed to resolve them. And if the person's not present, then we take it to the Lord and we, and we pay it back to the Lord. Chapter 5, verse 11, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, If any man's wife goes astray and behaves unfaithfully toward him, and a man lies with her carnally, and it is hidden from the eyes of her husband, and it is concealed that she has defiled herself, and there was no witness against her, nor was she caught, if the spirit of jealousy comes upon him and he becomes jealous of his wife who has defiled herself, or if the spirit of jealousy comes upon him and he becomes jealous of his wife, although she has not defiled herself. This is a long explanation, but basically, the wife basically has been playing around, and the husband doesn't know about it, but somehow the, wife, the husband's like, that Facebook account was left open. Of course, back then it wasn't Facebook, but you know, get my... And you just happen to see the... There's a lot of conversations with this guy, Joe. Who's Joe? Oh, he was an old boyfriend from high school. We're just, we just reconnected on Facebook. Really? Okay. Just your average Joe. Yeah, oh yeah. What's going on there? And, and, and what they had is God was laying out for them a system, if you will, a truth serum, a way to detect whether the person was telling the truth or not. Now, times are no different today. Actually, they're probably worse today, but they've just the same problems. Infidelity statistics, when I heard these statistics, my jaw dropped. The statistics as of 2017, How many marriages do you think experience an infidelity, either one spouse or the other? How many people think it's more than 10%? How many think it's more than 25%? How many think it's more than 50%? Yeah, you're too negative, okay? <laughs> it's only a third, all right? But still, a third of all American marriages experience at least one partner confesses, not necessarily even to the other partner, but is willing to, in a survey, to admit that they've been unfaithful to their spouse. One third of all marriages in the United States as of 2017. One third. We got a lot of marriages in here. Ooh, that's a little close to home. That's a little close to home. What do we do with that? What do we do with that? How about this? 22% of men say, or should I say admit, that they've cheated on their significant other. 22% of men. 14% of women. Some of you are like, well, if it's one-third, how's it 22%? Because it's 22% of the men, 14% of the women, and there you combine those, that, that's how you get 33 or 36% in the marriage, okay? 36% of men and women admit to having an affair with a co-worker. Wow. Wow. 17% of men and women admit to having an affair with a sister-in-law or brother-in-law. That, like, What? No, it's not supposed, that's not supposed to, well, none of this is supposed to be, but we live in a time where it's like, eh, you know, it's in the family, keep it in the family. <laughs> Crazy. You, know, you don't have the statistic on the screen, but people who have cheated before are 350% more likely to cheat again. Wow. Wow. The statistics are just you know, crazy. They just continue on. 10% of affairs begin online. 10% of them. And 40% of the time, online affairs turn into real life affairs. Why do I go into this? Well, it's interesting to statistics, but statistically, you're part of the statistics. Statistically, there are people in this room that are either are having an affair or they're on the edge. And that defiles. It defiles not only the marriage, but it defiles the church. It affects us all. Not just, oh, it's just between me and this other person. It's just, well, it's just between my, my, my wife, my wife and, and we're having a hard time. We're going through a rocky time period, and, and she and I are like this. It's oil and water, and, and I just really connect over here. Sin, run, run. 1 Corinthians 6, 18, run from sexual sin. No other sin so clearly affects the body as this one does. God's saying, you got to run. You can't tolerate this. You can't play with this and not get burned. There are people in, in our 
in, in the body here right today that you're thinking about it. You're thinking about it. You're toying with it. And God's saying, run. Run. Do not tolerate it. Cast them out of, out of the camp. Well, here's, this, is the, this is where the, the verse, this chapter gets interesting. So Numbers 5.15, 5, um, you know, the husband's suspicious that something's going on. So here's what the remedy is. 5.15, then the man shall bring his wife to the priest. He shall bring the offering required for her, one-tenth of an ephah of barley meal. He shall pour no oil on it and no frankincense on it because it is a grain offering of jealousy, an offering for remembering for bringing iniquity to remembrance. Okay, so they're supposed to bring this offering of barley. They're not supposed to put oil. Oil is always a representation of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit's not involved. Frankincense is a representation of prayer and a fragrant offering. Not involved. It's just this ephah of um, a barley, a little cup of barley meal. And they're getting ready to offer it. Notice the purpose. An offering for remembering, for bringing iniquity to remembrance. This is God's truth serum. Did it really happen? And God's going to cause something to bring about, um, to bring about the truth. It's a little bit odd, though. Verse 16. And the priest shall bring her near and set her before the Lord. The priest shall take holy water in an earthen vessel and take some of the dust that is on the floor of the tabernacle and put it into the water. Then the priest shall stand the woman before the Lord, uncover the woman's head, and put the offering for remembering in her hands, which is the grain offering of jealousy. And the priest shall have in his hand the bitter water that brings a curse. The priest shall put, his, put her under the oath and say to the woman, If no man has lain with you, and if you have not gone astray to uncleanness while under your husband's authority, be free from this bitter water that brings a curse. But if you have gone astray while under your husband's authority, and if you have defiled yourself and some man other than your husband has lain with you, then the priest shall put the woman under the oath of the curse, and he shall say to the woman, The Lord make you a curse and an oath among your people when the Lord makes your thigh rot and your belly swell. And may this water that causes the curse go into your stomach and make your belly swell and your thigh rot. And the woman shall say, Amen. So be it. Strange. Okay, this is one of those really strange passages. So the... the the woman, she's got this ephah, there's this uh, barley flour, basically. It's like a, fl uh, like a you know, flour to make a cake with. Um, and so she's holding this, and she's, the, the priest takes some water, and he scrapes up some dust from the floor of the tabernacle, okay? This dust. And he puts it in the water, and then he's going to give it to her to drink, and, she, and basically saying, if you drink it and you're innocent, nothing's going to happen. But if you're guilty... Your thigh is going to rot, and your belly is going to swell. Okay. That's strange things. Now, um, we see later on in the passage that there's an indication of the, the curse also being barrenness. Remember, among women, if you, were, if you weren't able to bear kids, there was it's thought to be a curse upon you. And so the idea is that this woman, it's almost like she's going to, um, the, the belly is going to, like, almost like she's going to have a baby, but not have the baby. She's going to look like she's going to have the baby, but she doesn't give birth. She's giving birth to sin is what she's giving birth to. And the thigh rotting is that idea of that whole area that was involved in the sin getting eaten away, which is what sin does. It eats away at us, slowly but surely. Verse 23, Then the priest shall write these curses in a book, and he shall scrape them off into the bitter water. And he shall make the woman drink the bitter water that brings a curse, and the water that brings the curse shall enter her to become bitter. Okay, this is also strange because um, we are not, we're not familiar with this, but they would take the book, they would write the words, and, and they would actually then scrape the paper so that it's like the words are falling into the water. Okay, so like the ink or whatever it is that they're using is going to fall into the water, and once again, it becomes that truth serum. Now, there's no incident, or there's no record, rather, of this ever being done. There's, you know, in the, the different, it didn't, there's no record of it in the, in the Bible, but not in the other um, works of the time. So we don't know if they actually did this or not, or if this, if God intended this just as a picture. Remember, all things are pictures and pointing to Jesus. They're all pointing to a New Testament principle, uh, this Old Testament picture, a New Testament principle. That's the purpose of all these things. And so 
we don't know what that, if that's the only thing or if this is really just as a, uh, um, a deterrent. Because if you knew that God had a secret potion that would make you tell the truth, it might deter you from that sin. If you knew that your, your husband or your wife would eventually find out, it might deter you just a little bit. I mean, that's the advantage or that's the, the philosophy anyway behind things like covenant eyes. You know, I, I said that initially one-third um, of marriages have infidelity. But if we take what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, if you've looked at a woman with lust in your heart, you've committed adultery. The result is it's 100% of marriages. And it's not just the guys. Gals, you're just as guilty. Oh, I, I don't look at the pictures. Yeah, but if you're reading the romance novels and your mind is going to finding, to finding comfort and finding consolation in something besides Jesus, that's adultery. Anything that you put in the place of God is adultery and idolatry. So here's the situation. God's got this special potion, and obviously it's supernatural. Um, it could be. It could be that just the natural things that were in the dust um, combined with the fact that, you know, we know from lie detector tests that when a person's lying, they, um, there's certain chemicals and, and there's things that go on, and that's why a lie detector test can detect that you're telling a, lo the tr a lie or a truth. Um, it could be that God put it all together, and so it was just a natural thing that happens supernaturally, or it could be a supernatural thing that happens naturally. But either way, God is saying he's the one that knows the truth, and he will bring the truth to light. He will allow the darkness to come into the light to expose the darkness. If you're in an affair right now, whether it's just online clicking at pictures that you shouldn't be looking, or whether it's with a coworker, God will bring it to light because he loves you. He loves you enough to not allow you to continue to be defiled. He loves you enough to say that the path that you're headed on is destruction. You read the book of Proverbs, and over and over again, it talks about the man that's led by the seat of his pants into that, the, the woman's house that is headed to hell, and he thinks it's okay. No. No. God loves you enough to say, don't do it. Don't do it. And God loves you enough to, con to continually get louder and louder. He will let you make your choice, but it will get so loud eventually that everybody else will hear what's, what's going on, and it all falls apart. We've seen it here. Not here at Reveal, but in, at the churches here in South Florida. Pastors. How many pastors in the last 10 years have fallen? Why? Because there's something that's not right. There's something that's not right. And God says, I love the flock, and I love that pastor, and I'm giving them an opportunity to repent. And if they don't repent, the consequences get the heat gets a little bit hotter in the hope to bring them to repentance. But if they don't come to repentance, then the result is it's going to come out because God loves his church too much. He wants to present a holy and a pure bride. That's what he wants to present. But he, it's not going to be holy and pure if it's been defiled. It's not. So where do we go with this? Verse 25 the priest shall take the grain offering of jealousy from the woman's hand, shall wave the offering before the Lord and bring it to the altar. And the priest shall take a handful of the offering and its memorial portion, burn it on the altar, and afterward make the woman drink the water. When he's made her drink the water, then it shall be, if she has defiled herself and behaved unfaithfully toward her husband, that the water that brings a curse will enter her and become bitter, and her belly will swell, her thigh will rot, and the woman will become a curse among her people. But if... The woman has not defiled herself and is clean, then she shall be free and may conceive children. And that's where we believe that there's that connection between infertility. Verse 29, this is the law of, left, of jealousy when a wife, while under her husband's authority, goes astray and defiles herself. Or when the spirit of jealousy comes upon a man and he becomes jealous of his wife, then he shall stand the woman before the Lord and the priest shall execute all this law upon her. Then the man shall be free from iniquity, but the woman shall bear her guilt. It's a somber passage. It doesn't end on a happy note. Where's the gospel principle here? Notice it's just about the woman. It's just about the woman. What about the man? What about the man? 
because there's lots of men that sin, and in fact, the percentages are higher, we just looked at them, that men cheat on their wives more than the women cheat on their husbands. Doesn't make it right, but it happens more. Why is it not addressed to the, to the man? Because the picture here is of Jesus, is the husband who will never cheat on his spouse. He will never cheat on you. And this whole thing, remember, is intended to bring the woman to repentance. Notice, the woman doesn't get the death penalty. What was supposed to happen in the case of adultery? Death penalty, stoning. In this case, the woman doesn't get the death penalty. Now, she, there's the thigh rot and there's the belly swell. You're like, well, that's pretty, pretty much my life's over. But the indication is, when we look at, think about the story of Jesus, and he's confronted with the woman caught in adultery. Okay? She's supposed to be stoned according to the law. What does Jesus do? He bends down and writes in the dust, there's a connection here, there's the dust connecting to this whole thing about the dust and the, uh, the idea of the dust from the temple and, and, and drinking the, that water with the dirt in it and bringing conviction. And ultimately, the righteousness is not her righteousness. She was guilty. But Christ's righteousness steps in and says, I paid for it. Does anyone condemn you? No, they all walk away because they couldn't. In, in, they were all guilty. They were all guilty of their sin. And yet this woman, who's also guilty, Jesus says, I'm not going to condemn you. You sense conviction. There was brokenness. Gee, if, if she wasn't broken, if she was unrepentant, it wouldn't have played out that way. But Jesus could look at her heart and see that she was shaking in her boots. She was, or her towel, whatever it is that she's wrapped in. She, and, and the result is, the result is God showing up and God saying, no, this one, this one's mine. This one is mine. And that's the picture here. Numbers five, you and I are the woman. You and I are the ones that God is trying to pull out the truth. God, is, God has given us an opportunity to repent, but he looks at us through the eyes of Christ and says, when we repent, when we come to him, when we come to him and say, I'm, I'm guilty, Jesus looks at us and says, go and sin no more. Let's pray. Lord God, Your salvation is a free gift. We didn't earn it. We didn't deserve it. In fact, we deserve just the opposite. And yet you extend it to us freely. God, thank you. Lord, thank you for reminding us that we are the woman. We are guilty. So, Lord, we come humbly before you to confess our sins. We come humbly before you to recognize Lord, I pray right now that your Holy Spirit would just be touching hearts and that you'd be reminding people of those areas where they've compromised, where they've allowed the defiling things in, where they've become, where not they, where we have become numb to sin. Lord, may your Holy Spirit search our hearts right now and just place your finger gently on those things that we're, we're allowing compromise and allowing that numbness to permeate our lives, to permeate our families, to permeate our computers, our, our cars. Lord, may your Holy Spirit convict us of those places where we are sharing and exposing the sins of others. Where we're intentionally making others look bad or where we're innocently, we're, we're not intending to make others look bad, but we're just sharing something and, and not even realizing it that we're gossiping. God, may your Holy Spirit convict us of areas where we've been focused on ourselves and our desires and our needs and our wants. Lord, where we come into the church and looking about us and bless me instead of, Lord, bless you. Lord, use me as a vessel to bless others. It's not about me and what I want. It's about what you want to do, Lord. Lord, use me as a vessel to bless others. Lord, the places where we need to bring restitution and forgiveness and release of debt. May you bring conviction. And finally, Lord, for those that have wandered in their marriage, wandered in their commitments, dabbling in porn or an affair, God, may you remind them the seriousness of sin, the seriousness of the consequences the fact that you will expose it. 
But at the same time, Lord, you love them. And you want to bring forgiveness. You want to bring restoration. You want to bring healing to those marriages that are stuck, that are, are, that are, that are cold and, and lifeless. Lord, you bring life into marriages. May you breathe life into those marriages right now that are stale, where a husband or a wife is looking elsewhere. May you bring conviction and life and repentance and hope. Thank you, God. We love you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Before you leave, take the opportunity to bless somebody. Take the opportunity to, to pray for somebody. and Just say, hey, how can I pray for you? Or even just walk up to somebody and say, can I pray for you? Prophesy over them. Watch what God does. Amen?